Okay, let's do it. <clears throat> so I hope you guys watched the video. That's pretty loud. And got your first taste of legged robots. Uh, I hope you enjoyed as much as I do uh, the fact that even though when we think about legged robots, you think about all this complexity of the humanoid, for instance, but actually there's still the really simple models that capture a lot of the fundamental principles, and you can sort of plot and solve everything. I just think that's so elegant. <clears throat> so, um, so we did kind of the dynamics version of the first version of the dynamics of legged robots. We'll do it again when we get to humanoids. Things get a little different when you have that many links, but um, <clears throat> and today we're going to talk about sort of the optimization, the begin the optimization side of that. I'm going to switch to my connector. I am suspicious of this connector. So um, let me say a few, just the, the high level points from, from Tuesday. And if you have any questions about that, it's totally uh, fair game to ask today, too. So a couple of the main points that I tried to put across. The first one was sort of a new notion of stability, right? Instead of the stability of a fixed point, we talked about the stability of a trajectory. But this time, we got the stability of a periodic cycle, which has a little bit of a different thing going on in the limit cycle stability, right? So first big point was sort of limit cycles in general and how to think about those. And we'll We'll look at them from an optimization perspective today. And you don't actually need contact to make limit cycles, right? In fact, the classic example was, for instance, the Van der Poel oscillator. There are many other oscillators out there. <clears throat> and the key idea was that we went from the notion of trajectory stability, which is sort of saying that my trajectory x of t goes to some nominal trajectory as time goes to infinity. Or maybe, um, to make the analogy more clear, we'll say that the difference between them under some norm goes to 0. Okay, This sort of limit as time goes to infinity. <clears throat> we talked about a new notion of stability, the orbital stability, the limit cycle stability. which was a lot like this, but we're going to now do right. Remember we talked before when we were talking about trajectory stabilization that time is marching along at some rate, right? Uh, one. Um, and whenever you, you know, if you, if you start from some point, then uh, you're always trying to catch up with the clocked signal. Even if you are very close to the trajectory over here, you know, if you were at the wrong time, you might try to go all the way back here and, and get back on. And this notion of orbital stability is actually doing the thing that I think intuitively is much more desirable, which is to say, wherever I am, all I want to say is that the closest, I'm allowed to do a search over tau some other you know, variable, and just say the distance to the closest point on the trajectory, that thing has to get smaller over time, right? Which was a, seems like a fundamentally better, it's a slightly harder to work with object, okay? But it's essential for limit cycle stability because limit cycle stability, uh, you know, the Van der Poel oscillator is not stable in this sense, right? If you were to think about the orbit of the Van der Poel oscillator, It had some sort of almost round, little squarey um, orbit, right? And let me get my colors, right? And the trajectories want to converge to that orbit in a beautiful way, right? You remember computing the ROA from this early, right? 
did you get the, the key point, right, was that if I have two points on that trajectory, they will never converge, right? There's a phase difference here, and uh, there's, there's no reason they have to converge, right? They, they will stay slightly out of phase going around for all time, yeah? So this notion of, traject of stability fails, but this notion of stability succeeds. Okay, so, and walking robots, in turn, are going to have a periodic stability, and it's often too much to ask for them to have this type of stability, but it's okay for them to have, in fact, this is, even the passive walkers are stable like this, but not stable like this. Okay. And you won't be surprised as we develop all our tools, there's a way to sort of do an LQR for this kind of thing. Okay, it takes a little bit more work, but you can do uh, a form of LQR for, for that type of stability. Okay, so that was one, oh, sorry, and you know, how do you get this in practice? The way we showed about it, showed it last time, it seems like a very difficult object to work with. Somehow we're going to have to do an optimization even just to define our, you know, error dynamics. Okay. But it turns out the Poincaré map, which is a very simple operation, if you can define the map, right, gives us this type of stability. The Poincaré map we'd, that was discussed in the lecture if you only examine the system here, then it abstracts time, and stability on the map here infers this type of stability on the trajectories. The amazing Poincaré Bendix theorems. Okay, so that was one key idea. Again, feel free to ask if you have questions. And the other key idea was somehow we got into contact. We started contact. There's a lot to know or say about contact dynamics, okay? In particular, the rimless wheel is actually a pretty good way to think about it. So we had that bicycle-like um, you know, wheel, but without with the rim removed, okay? And we, we, we treat it as, as a pin joint here. But the dynamics were first the dynamics of a simple pendulum, okay? But then there was an additional dynamics when that foot hits the ground, we had an instantaneous impulsive collision, okay? And that, there was an assumption there that the moment that this collides is the, also the moment that this comes off and I become a new pendulum at the new location. And that completely defined the dynamics of the rimless wheel, okay? But that was our first sort of simple model of the way contact looks like. It turns out it's a pretty good model, right? Assuming things are perfectly instantaneous, impulsive, dissipative, uh, is of course not, that's a simplification, but it's actually a very effective simplification for computation. So we would write the dynamics of this in two phases. We call it the stance phase. which is the pendulum dynamics, basically. Plus a discrete impact event. I'll call this maybe, I'll even emphasize that this is a continuous dynamics in the stance phase and the discrete impact event whenever, at the moment, the foot strike. a small, a little bit of imagination to call the, call it a foot, but we'll go with, go with that, okay? And it turned out in the pendulum dynamics with the, the you thought about angular, conservation of angular momentum around the new point, it turns out the whole thing was very simple, but we, we write it as a discrete update. So I had, at the moment of collision, I have theta and theta dot as my state, right? I have x is theta and theta dot of the pendulum. And I said, theta dot, at the moment just after the impact, just instantaneously at the, you know, at, the, at the moment of collision, but just after, was actually, it turned out to be, it didn't have to be, but turned out to be a pretty simple function of the theta dot just before the impact. Right? Maybe if I write it out a little bit more thoroughly, I could, that's sort of shorthand for um, E plus 
equals cosine two alpha theta dot t minus. Do you remember what alpha was? This is how I check if you guys watched. Yeah. Exactly. Right. It depended how how. It was, this was alpha here. Okay. So the the broader you take your angles between it, the more energy you lose when you have an impact. Right. If you take alpha to zero, then you're actually a wheel, and you have no impact losses because we don't have model, rolling friction here. At some point, you'd have rolling friction again. Cool. And there, the other thing we, we sort of snuck into the discrete impact map was the, a resetting of the coordinates back to that. Uh, so we could think of it again as a system, a pendulum. OK, so this, this combination of continuous plus discrete uh, is called the hybrid dynamics. Hybrid for continuous plus discrete. Not gas and electric or all the other things hybrid is, is uh, used for. A little overloaded. All right, so those are the big lessons, apart from like, you know, how beautiful rimless wheels and compass gates and neat compass gate walkers can be. Um, <clears throat> so what I want to do today is now start thinking about how do we do computation around those kind of models, okay? So uh, first off, let's just even find limit cycles. How do you, how do we find limit cycles? Um, for instance, that Van der Poel oscillator, I think I put it in here. Right, here's our Van der Poel oscillator. I, I drew it badly, I could have just put up the plot I already had ready. But that's, so how do we find that black line? Okay, so the Van der Poel oscillator is, um, is like almost globally stable, right? It's stable from every point except for the origin, which is also a fixed point. So this one, I could find that limit cycle by just simulating forward and waiting until I found something that was sort of periodic. Right? And that works. Uh, but it's pretty inefficient. And it doesn't work for like the need compass gate, right? If you remember this need compass gate, um, this is a completely passive system. People have built them. I've, I've built them badly. Uh, and they have an extremely small basin of attraction, right? So you have to get that thing just right, give it just the right push, right? And then it'll fall and go into a stable limit cycle. But if you're just off a little bit, then you're not going to find it. So. You know, taking a random initial condition, simulating it forward is not strong enough to find the limit cycles of this thing. You'd have to, it's like finding a needle in the haystack of initial conditions. So we need something stronger, right? Um, how do we find limit cycle? How, how do we find fixed points? I mean, just to remind you or think about it slightly differently. Right, if I have x dot equals f of x, and I want to find the fixed points of that, I can do that with optimization, right? I could set up an optimization problem, say, find me an x, or even, I don't even need an objective. I can just say, find me with the decision variables x, something where f of x equals 0, right? That's the conditions for x being a fixed point. And this is uh, potentially nonlinear, non-convex optimization. But it's a pretty simple one, right? You can put this into, um, into any optimization solver. You could use SNOPT for it. You can use something simpler, and you'll probably be able to for, you know, Depending on how complicated F is, right? It's going to it's going to be uh, impossible to find. Okay, so let's do the same thing, but for limit cycles. Okay, so how do we find a periodic solution? Right, 
right? A limit cycle is a periodic solution that is either stable or unstable. Um, it's, if it's marginally stable, then it's not technically a limit cycle. It's not the limit either forward in time or backward in time. But that's just a detail. Okay. So, but it's a periodic solution, um, <coughs> right? So we know how to do trajectory optimization. Let's find us some trajectory x. I think it's important right from the beginning to say we're going to have to search over time also that we're going to allow uh, our domain of x to be uh, defined over some time, okay, such that x dot equals f of x somehow for all t, although we'll, we'll use our standard, you know, direct transcription, direct shooting approximations for that. And then we can just say the initial conditions, which we used to say was, was uh, you know, fixed. Now we'll just say the initial conditions, which were our decision variable, and the final conditions have to be the same. Right? So everything we just did, right, we could do this with direct shooting, transcription, direct transcription, direct collocation, you name it. And that all just works fine. Here's the direct collocation version. I've got the Vanderpool. I'm going to let time in the direct collocation codes. It lets time be a decision variable by default. I add equal time interval constraints just so it keeps them, um, it doesn't bunch them up too much. I, pick a, I just say that I want an uh, initial state that's on the surface of section somewhere on this pink line and actually importantly away from the origin because there is a trivial solution that is technically periodic which is just zero for everything. So I want to pull it away from that a little bit. Okay, But basically just, um, and then the final state equals the initial state. And then there's the solution. So I, I initialized it with just some guess that ran around the circle, sampled very coarsely, right? And then uh, in two iterations, roughly, it converges on the stable limit cycle. It's just snapped doing its thing for mathematical program. Yeah? Okay, awesome. So there's, there's two ways that that could manifest. The first one is in time, right? And if you were to like, you go around the circle, but you just kind of hop and you don't line up. The, that's why I say time must be a decision variable too, because it's very, in, unless you happen to know, which is very rare, exactly the, the duration of the, of the cycle, then, then you're going to miss it with high probability, right? So I think let the time stretch and shrink in the optimization to address that. And then you know, the accuracy in terms of state is up to the numerical accuracy of the integration, uh, you know, thinking about the transcriptions as different integration uh, methods. So direct collocation has third order accuracy. It depends how many points you put around, but you're right, there's a numerical approximation there. Yeah? Uh, yeah, both. I think you could, you could have x equals 0 and capital T equals 0. That's why there's two things. Um, first of all, I, I said the initial conditions have to be here. And I believe I left out the origin by a little bit. And the other thing is I started it with an initial guess that went around in a circle that, so that it wasn't even like trying to get back there. Yeah. yeah. That's correct. This is um, a trajectory that uh, I initialized here. Is that, that's my initial guess. The next visualization, uh, so which is the major iteration of SNAP, it calls my visualization function and it drew this one. And then it probably drew about you know, 14 or 15 or whatever more that are all like on top of each other. So it effectively converged very, you know, very quickly. As it, it, the default tolerances in SNAP are like 1e to the minus 6 or 1e to the minus 8, depending on which. Term. So it's like doing extra work to tie it in, but 
effectively it got very quickly. Okay, now here's the thing. So this seems like simple, right? And it's exactly what we did before. Doing it for walking robots is almost as simple, right? And the only thing is that we have to account for this sort of discrete impact event. But that fits in just fine. So let's do the same thing for the rimless wheel. Again, the rimless wheel um, is so darn stable that you could just simulate forward and find the cycle, but the need compass gate is not, okay? So, again, I want to have the trajectory be able to stretch and shrink so that it lines up perfectly. I'll pick some integration method to approximately achieve the dynamics. And now, if you remember, the limit cycle that we're searching for, uh, theta, theta dot, okay, it, These two colors here. It looked kind of like this. First, so there were two critical points, theta. One where the well, there's one theta where the heel's on the ground on the backwards, you know, up the slope, and there's another one where the heel's on the ground, uh, you know, downwards. So that was gamma mi um, minus alpha and gamma plus alpha. So I actually know that the trajectory should not leave that. The ground constraints. And then the actual orbit looks something like this. It would look just like the, this is the eyeball. This is a, like a glancing blow around the eyeball that's over here, the eyeball that's over here. This is the unstable fixed point, and it does this thing, um, right? To get the, that's the stable limit cycle we're searching for. So the way I'm going to say it in the optimization is I'm going to formulate this optimization problem. X over time is my decision variables, discretized, you know. Let's time stretch and shrink. And then I'll say, I want that theta zero has got to be at one of those, you know, I'll start it, let's say, here. I want to find basically this part of the trajectory first. I'll say that theta t, rather than being equal to theta zero, I want it to be on this line. Okay, that's not enough yet because it could be anywhere, you know, here. I want the one that's a stable fixed point, or well, a, a, a true limit cycle. But I also have that theta dot zero, which is the what, where I should get back to after the reset map, is going to be cosine two alpha times theta dot at t. Right? So I picked. In this case, the end of the trajectory. And I said I'm going to apply that discrete reset and get and make that match the initial condition. Right? And actually I can also say, since I know I can actually say, you know, for all for all t theta of t is That doesn't, that's actually not needed for this um, optimization. It's so simple, but on principle, if you know things, like it can't, it shouldn't, you don't want those solutions that go through the ground, you're better off telling the solver uh, what you know. Yes? So, uh, that x uh, it's, it's true uh, along this entire trajectory up to numerical in, uh, approximation, yeah? So even here, I want x dot, I want theta dot to be consistent with, uh, so it's, it's, you, it, this is like, it's got two sets of constraints on it, right? It's got the constraints from this and the constraints from this. Both must be matched, and that's what defines, no? There's a whole manifold, if I, if I just say that the d dynamics are true, and these alone, then there's a whole manifold of solutions moving up and down, right? So, you know, this would be a solution, this would be a solution, you know, 
And I need to actually add a new constraint to pick the one I want, which is the periodic solution. It's exactly the one where the energy dissipated lands exactly back where I started. In this model, it's just theta and theta dot. We did a, we'll, we'll talk about that again in a minute. In the simple math, we reduced everything down to just theta and theta dot by making assumptions about, you know, I can just reset the coordinate system back to the original place, basically always make it rotate around the origin. And if I want to bookkeep how far I walk, I'll do that separately. Okay, so that works too, right? So almost identical code, direct co-location, add equal time interval constraints. I said at all not points, I want slope between alpha, slope minus alpha and slope plus alpha. And the initial constraint, final constraint, exactly what I wrote on the board, and then the velocity is cosine two alpha, and I find the, the periodic cycle of the rimless wheel. Right? It's like super simple, right? But we just solved for a walking a cycle for a walking robot. The only thing that mattered was we took we took the, the continuous trajectory optimization we already knew. We made it periodic, you know. But but uh, and then we added the discrete event at a critical moment between at the boundary of my trajectories. It's easy to add extra jump constraints. So this is actually, um, this is a, the simplest form of what we'll call hybrid trajectory optimization. We'll generalize it in a minute, okay? But um, it's really a workhorse, actually, uh, for, for, for legged locomotion research. I don't know, somewhere around uh, 2006, seven, something like that. Uh, these tools just people kind of realized how powerful these tools were and a lot of people in legged robots were using this uh, certainly in the passive dynamic kind of community uh, but even sort of the people who are thinking about biomechanics of walking were using <coughs> we're looking at these simple models okay and then using uh, trajectory optimization to basically interrogate the, the, the landscape of these simple walking models right so uh, Almost a compass gate, but he put a spring in the middle. This is Manoj, who is uh, Nidhi's uh, advisor. Yeah, uh, and uh, I'll tell you what that means in a second. But basically, this simple model, which you can explore the space for uh, with optimization, he the, the cool thing about the paper was that the same model could both walk and run, and do something weird in the middle. Yeah, and there's actually a really cool. If you if you think about the bio, some of you know this very well, but there's there's um, some really cool things uh, that connect optimization to biomechanics. So there's you know kind of a general idea that maybe people try to minimize work when they move. It's not the only thing they minimize, and it's actually pretty subtle. Okay, at some point you know if you're being attacked by a lion, you're not minimizing energy probably. You know, but sort of if you put a person on a treadmill and measure their volume of oxygen consumed, uh, you know, which is also not the best. You know, not a super uh, there's subtlety in getting good measurements out of that, okay? Then <clears throat> what you can see is as you change the speed of the treadmill, people take different amounts of, uh, of energy to walk at certain speeds. And if you ask them to, to walk at a certain stride frequency, they have certain sort of points in their, uh, in their power curve. And if you let them pick, right, then they tend to pick the bottoms of, you know, the minima of these, opto of these sort of energy curves. And even more than that, if you ask them to, um, if you just change the treadmill speed, okay, and you don't, so the, these experiments, it was actually said, you must walk, that's your instructions, and they started speeding up the treadmill, so people were like, you know, trying to walk super fast to get here, okay, or you must run, and here they're like actually running uncomfortably slow. If you instead ask them to walk or run, you do whatever you want to do, I'm just going to mess around with the treadmill speed, then 
the point which, at which they choose naturally to transition between walking and running is like it's famously 2.2 meters per second for the average you know, subject. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I would say, I don't think this one, I mean, it might have anecdotally commented, but there's actually been a lot more work much more recently than this book. Um, Max Donnellan is the person I know that does it really well, and they've done very sophisticated energy measurements, like down to the metabolic level. They have like, um, I don't even remember all the chemistry of it, but they have ways to really look at uh, detailed muscle mechanics while people are walking, and they talk about the rates now, because they can measure these things at much higher rates and learning and stuff like that. Yeah, right? So it's not just snopped. It's people, too, do optimization, right? And, uh, and of course, you can, you can do the same thing with these simplified walking models and, and have them transition from walking to running at certain critical velocities. And it doesn't come up with the magic 2.2 unless you dial it in super carefully. These are, these are non-dimensional, so. <clears throat> and there are these class of walkers that came out. Hartmut is a, was, a, was doing, studying similar models sort of at a parallel time to Manoj and Andy. But uh, yeah, these beautiful models that are a little bit more than what I showed you last time. They're kind of combining some of the running spring models with the, the walking models, and they can exhibit all these gates. And people find these things with, uh, with optimization. Cool, yeah? OK, let me generalize that. So that one had, um, you know, if you have two legs, you've got multiple impacts, potentially. Or um, certainly, you can get into much more complicated situations where that very simple recipe I, I said is not quite enough. So here's the more general picture that I, that I think uh, will help you in a lot of problems, right? So this is sort of the hybrid dynamics picture. So the hybrid dynamics in this sense is described by some differential equation. Let me describe it as F1, X1. You could have a control input U. Okay. I've got some um, trajectory that's sort of completely continuous. And then I'm going to define the conditions on which, for instance, when the rimless wheel's foot hits the ground, on, on which a discrete event happens. Okay, and at that discrete event, I'm going to have a, an update. I'll give you the exact names for these. Okay, and then I'm going to continue on with another trajectory. It could be a completely different dynamics here. The inputs sort of have to be the same. Okay, and you might have, maybe you have another one over here, and you can stitch these things together as much as you like. Okay, so the language we're going to use for this is we're going to call these continuous segments the modes, the hybrid modes. We're going to define the conditions in which the event happens as a function of x described by the zero level set, zero crossing of some function, okay? And these are called the guards. or sometimes uh, witness functions. Okay, And then this here we write as um, x plus is some function of x minus. We call this the, the reset map. And it's a discrete event. Typically, we, um, we don't include u in the reset. There are cases where you can kind of justify it, but we think of that as being an instantaneous event, and no actuator really can, can act instantaneously. There's cases where people have like um, kickoff, like a piston loaded up, and it sort of kicks off almost instantaneously, and you might think of that as having a u in the reset map. 
it's not a law against it, but just in practice, since I think of that as instantaneous, it seems a little weird to like put torque uh, as an input. Yeah. Okay, so mode one, mode two, guard, reset. Yeah, that's the language of hybrid systems, and it can be used for um, like people use it a lot in driving, where like uh, you might, especially if you have a transmission, maybe you have. Uh, gear one, gear two, and the transitions between them are modeled as these discrete events, right? And people have done a lot of controls around um, power uh, transmissions and stuff like this that have to think about a hybrid dynamics. You can have as many modes as you like. You can actually even have multiple guards for the same mode. Like if you happen to go over here, maybe you'd have a different jump to a different place. Right, so what if, I mean, uh, I'm here, I could bump into this wall or I could bump into that wall, right? And they might be very different. I could have my left foot hit the ground or my right foot hit the ground, right? And so the conditions that define my impacts, there might be multiple guards for one mode. There's always one reset per guard. The law that, what that gets triggered if you have that, if you cross that witness function. And this, if you think about this, like this, um, I, I use phi here partly because we've used that before, you know, as the sine distance function. Right? So, the, for instance, the sine distance between my foot and the ground, when that equals zero, is when my event triggers. So it plugs in naturally. That's not the only kind of guard you have, but that's a common one in walking. So, for instance, if I have a that's a robot foot, um, I'm going to say it's got. Uh, cleats on or something just so I have less, I don't have to think about the continuous uh, interaction yet. Okay, and let's say there's ground like this. Right, so you might have sort of mode one is the uh, foot in air. Mode two would be the heel, the heel on the ground. During a you know standard gait, let's see, mode three would be the whole foot on the ground. Mode four, only toe on ground. Okay, and then I can transition back to like this, for instance. The guard here is often called heel strike. You could call this one toe strike, let's say. Toe down, right? And then this is heel off, toe off. And that's a sort of standard view for one foot of a a standard gait. Turns out people don't actually have perfectly flat feet. When I was a grad student, I tried to make like sheet aluminum slippers, so I could. Yeah, that was a bad idea. Like I almost broke my ankle. Um, feet feet bend, and they're much better than this. So, but uh, but it makes the math harder. So there you go. This isn't even a complete picture, right? Because uh, Actually, there's probably, when this, foot, when this one heel is on the ground, you could have a different mode, if you will, for sticking contact versus sliding contact if you started to slip. Right? So you can break it down more or less fine. But uh, oftentimes, people think about the transition between sticking and sliding as basically turning on or off different dynamics that are smooth. Yeah, questions? Quiet today. Hope it's because it's exceedingly clear. Okay, let me actually. Um, I'll do a, the simple version of that spring mass uh, walker. Is actually this, the simplest version is called the spring loaded inverted pendulum. Which is 
called the slip model. It's, uh, it's one of the famous models. The rimless wheel is very famous. The compass gate is very famous. And slip is very famous. Okay, And it's, um, it just looks like this. It's uh, basically the <coughs> imagine a point mass in the air with a massless leg, which goes through transitions where the heel hits the ground. And then suddenly the spring collapses. And it kind of goes through a, a mode, you know, and it'll eventually like this. So this, so Mark Rayburn's hopping robots. This is kind of the simplest mathematical model of some of the hopping robots, and it'll take back off and, and have a flight phase. And this also can have a periodic solution, and it's uh, stable if, by some definition of stability, I mean the. Uh, it's not stable in total energy because it's passive and there's no dissipation. There's no dissipation because the, we assume there's a massless toe here so, and a spring in between. So when your, heel, when your foot hits the ground, no energy is lost. Okay? So the system can't actually be uh, sort of completely stable, but it's, the cycle can be stable up to an energy. All right, let me just show you kind of how we write that. OK, so here's how um, you can define the, the dynamics of the spring-loaded inverted pendulum in Drake. It's similar in MATLAB Simulink kind of things, OK? so. I have a handful of parameters, gravity, mass, leg length, rest length of the leg, spring constant, OK? And then in addition to defining the dynamics function, the continuous dynamics, we actually define, in Drake, you can define a witness function, OK? And associate it with uh, you know, the event of touchdown. And you can uh, associate it with the reset map, too. So it'll, it'll go through those, that exactly the dynamics just for simulation, OK? I have another witness function for takeoff. I did a witness function at the apex just because I was, I'm a, the, the standard uh, analysis of this is the apex to apex map. That's typically where you make your Poincaré map for this guy. OK, and then Drake's um, integrators know how to do zero crossing detection and the like. So it actually simulates very accurately if you declare a witness function. You say something important happens here, then the simul simulator, when it crosses the zero function, the, the, it does a zero crossing, it'll actually go back and take smaller and smaller time steps in the integrator to, until it finds with very high accuracy, what accuracy you pick, that event. And then it registers the discrete event and then continues on, which is essential to do uh, accurate simulation of these models. And then you can find sort of periodic solutions of the little hopping robot. Yeah. And you can plot the apex to apex map, just like the rimless wheel kind of maps we plotted last time. You can actually see some stable and unstable fixed points. Okay, So this language of uh, modes, guards, witnesses in that case, resets, is, is pervasive both in the optimization but even in the simulation. That one first is just a simulation. Uh, and it was, I put it, it, it jumped, it, it probably converged in a step or two into the, to the nominal limit cycle. Mm -hmm. Actually, there's one other trick maybe I should show you there now that you're starting to think about projects. Um, I wrote the dynamics. If you look, um, I use this thing, slip state, okay? So that I could write the dynamics like by calling out r dot, theta dot, x dot. Rather than trying to say, you know, x3 is this and having to remember the numbers of all your state variables, you can do something, uh, where did I define it here? I can define, uh, you know, Python has these, has the, it makes it easy to, to make a, we call it a named view, okay? You just say it's a, it's a, it sits on top of your data structure, your vector, and applies names to the elements, so you can refer to them by name. And so, like, for, Acrobats, you don't need it, 
right? But when you, when you get to little dog, you need it, right? Because you're not going to remember whether, you know, variable 14 is the left knee or the right knee or what, okay? You don't really need it for the slip, but it's, it's, clean, it's a little bit cleaner to do that. So that's a good, that's a good trick. Cool. So um, the rimless wheel, the compass gate, even the slip model, we did all those derivations by hand. Uh, I did all those derivations by hand. Uh, well, people before me and I redid them. But uh, uh, I, didn't, I was about to say I stole them, but that's not true. I redid it. I was like on the pencil and paper and made sure I got it right. Um, right. But there's a, a more general recipe, uh, which for the most part you just don't have to know, because I think almost every case that you, you need, the the, wrap, the tools that we wrap around it will do this for you. But if you need to compute the result of the impact dynamics, you can get that directly out of uh, the multibody equations. So if you're at the level of, um, I have you know, multibody equations See that in a little bit. That's, the con that's how the contact forces enter. Okay, if you come and you just have a multi-body plant telling me I've got these equations, and I now suddenly say that um, at a certain time, this constraint turns on. Right, so my heel hit the ground, and I'm going to say it's going to stick to the ground. Then you can actually derive what the instantaneous loss of energy has to be right from the, the governing equations, right? And it's, it's a little bit of work, but you just have to think about impulses. You can, you can derive it as a closed form, exp well, a uh, big pseudo inverse expression. It's not pretty, but V plus, or, which is like Q dot plus, is a big ugly thing of the Jacobian, the kinematic Jacobians of where you get from the original one. Or it has a simpler implicit form. If you're if you're in the middle of an optimization, you can just write that. Okay, I didn't intend to say the details of that, but uh, just to, so you're aware of it, there's a general recipe. Okay, so that's a workhorse. It's actually like a pretty powerful toolbox. There's one major limitation to the toolbox, which is that. Um, you know, knowing that mode sequence, but right? so did, maybe did I make it clear? Like if I had that trajectory, that, that list, then the way I'm gonna write an optimization problem, given that list, is I'm gonna associate a trajectory segment with mode one, a separate trajectory segment with mode two, my third trajectory segment with mode three, right? So I'm gonna have exactly that many decision variables. And I'm going to say that the final condition of this one goes through the reset and goes to the initial condition of this one. Right? So if I were to be considering solutions, which somehow went from foot in the air to like toe only on the ground, if my toe hit first, the optimizer is not going to be able to find that. Right? I, didn't even, I didn't even give it the power, the, the, the dynamics definition to find that. So by doing this, it works very well. It's a, kind of a workhorse. But it has a, one major limitation, which is that it asks you to pre-select pre the mode sequence. Okay. There are ways to relax that, but there, um, we'll talk about that in a future lecture, because it's, things get worse <laughs> before they get better. Okay, but if you can specify a mode sequence, then you can write a full optimization, like, you know, find me 
x dot, u dot. Maybe I want to minimize something. x1, u1, t1, x2, u2, t2, and so on, so that So on the dynamics constraints, you can write for all of them. You could say that for all um, k, I can say that this is a general rule is if I know I'm only going to try to collide at the end at the end step, then I can say I want to be greater than zero for all k, greater than or equal to zero, and then only equal to zero at let's say capital K1, or um, let me roughly say T1, okay, equals zero, and so on and so forth, right? And then um, X2, zero equals delta one times X1, and so forth. These help a lot. These say that it's not only to, it's not not just that I will collide or I will hit my my zero crossing at time t, but you want to say I won't hit it at before time t. Right? You can add initial condition constraints if it's just a one time through contact. You can add periodicity constraints if you're trying to find a limit cycle. Yeah. Of the type of transcription we're doing right now, which is this hybrid trajectory optimization with a fixed mode sequence. The fact that we're transcribing between our math and our SNOPT and choosing to make decision variables one per mode and connecting them with constraints, mode one going to mode two, mode two going to mode three. If you have to write a constraint saying mode one could go to two or to three, that's a disjunctive constraint, which is not the way you'd want to typically just hand it to an op. Like the or constraints are not the stuff that opt even a nonlinear optimizer like SNOP would like you to give it. So we're, we'll need new tools for handling those kind of disjunctive constraints. Yeah? For the same reason that you asked about before. Yes. Um, yes, I think the right answer is that, that I can't think of a transcription that has T as a variable that is not, that is convex. For instance, yes. T times F prime, so you get a bilinearity. We actually, in the group, have been working on relaxing that you, t you tend to get bilinear things if your thing would have been convex except for this time scaling. And you can do convex approximations of that, but they're approximations. And sometimes they're good enough to do really awesome things, but they're approximations. Yeah? Um, are there ways that you can do that in the Yes, but it's, it gets into these kind of disjunctive constraints or softening constraints. Yeah, we're going to, I promise we'll cover it. But this out of the box is assuming that you know the sequence. And this is, I mean, frankly, this is the one that works best. So if you do know the sequence, you're better off doing this. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's very problem specific, but um, I think the success of these is on par with the success of, un of a smooth trajectory optimization. So again, you might need initial guess, but the, the tools can can work fairly well. If you put it in a place where it's got um, collision avoidance constraints where you have to go left or right, then you're going to need an initial guess to pick the right side of that. Because right? you could, I could embed in any one of my modes all of the problems that we've talked about with 
smooth trajectory optimization. Right? So it's not going to be better than that. But these kind of constraints are, um, are not worse than the smooth optimization. However, when we start doing like the complementarity constraints, that's where things get decidedly worse uh, for the solver. Yeah? I think uh, in this case, that, that or is hard to write. That's the disjunctive constraint. So I think we're really talking about a, a sequence, a, a fixed sequence. We're going to relax it, but that's what we got today. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. That's what I'm going to do that in a second. Great question. I don't want to derive all of these for little dog, right? Yeah, I don't, and you don't, definitely. Okay, let me show you one more fun example, and then we'll do, we'll answer that question. Um, I was thinking about like what's a simple problem that kind of shows the mode sequence. This is what I came up with. Okay. <clears throat> And it maybe speaks to the local minima kind of idea too, right? So let's say you want to do a, a bounce pass with a basketball, right? So I could have a mode sequence that says bounce once. I could have a mode sequence that bounce twice, right? Or zero bounces, whatever. I made a, a simple optimization that solves, you tell it the number of bounces. It makes that many segments, right? As a loop over bounces, I'm going to add these kind of constraints. And then I basically want to get to my target, right? And here we go. This is like all of them plotted on top of each other. I basically said, here's, it's actually pretty cool that you can always get to the, the target with all these different solutions, yeah? You could break it. You could mess with the amount of time or whatever, but it wasn't hard to find something that could kind of find all of the solutions. Um, and I should, I should say also that, uh, Although this is a major limitation, if you do know the mode sequence, you're actually helping the optimizer avoid local minima, right? So let me make that point. Imagine I have a, um, let's see if I can make a basketball or something. So um, say I'm going to do a, I have an initial condition, or initial guess at my trajectory that's somehow going like this, yeah? And the solution, let's say maybe I don't, um, it's too far. I have a velocity limit on my initial condition, so I can't actually make it to my target. So the solution that I need is actually to bounce, and get over there. If, um, if I'm currently exploring trajectories there, there is no signal, there's no gradient of that solution that tells me that I should, be, I should go over and bounce against the floor. I can do better if I bounce against the floor. There's just no signal, right? However, if I say, you know, there's a floor over here, I want you to be there at time, or, you know, at some fraction of your trajectory, right? Then it, like, it's a strong signal that will pull the optimization and actually the gradient of phi, which gets used in the optimization, uh, tells me how to get to the floor. So you should think of this as um, not only avoiding the sort of or cases that are bad for optimization, but it actually kind of guides the optimization uh, to make contact or not with gradients. Okay, so that, I thought that was cool, but kind of bound, uh, boring. So I went online and tried to find some guy that could make a, a trick shot. Did I put it in here? Yeah. So I found this guy. He like threw it up against the wall and then went like this and then, ah, you know, like I know, right? So. I was like, okay, we can do that with optimization. And uh, so I started here, and I threw it here, whoop, boom, like that. And uh, you know, you had to get, I had to get the collision equations, had to capture the, the frictional contact. You know, so it's, it's, I couldn't, it, it's not enough to just think about the x, y position of this. The ball has to be rotating. It has frictional contact that hits the wall, and so it rolls up and spins out. That's all in the, um, in these notes, I actually, Use that as an example now in the notes. Ball, the spinning ball bouncing on the ground, when you derive those equations, it tells you, including the, the angular momentum terms, um, how to get that right. And yeah, it just solves 
right? Way easier than the guy who probably tried it for a long time before he got it in the basket. But not as cool. And let me show one more here. So since check deep asked. Let me... OK. Uh, again, you don't want to see my to-do list. I forgot to. Okay, here's a little dog. That's what we had before Spot. That's actually a simulation of it standing. Awesome. Um, and then, you know, when you think about, when you look in the gate literature, for let's say for quadrupeds, people make uh, breakdown locomotion in gates, right? You know about walking gates, rotary gallop, um, tra traverse, transverse gallops, trots, bounds, you've heard of these, right? Pronk. Uh, so you can, you can break down the different gates of a quadruped with this. And actually, the, uh, back from Moybridge, who was the, one of the first people that sort of made these diagrams, they're basically mode sequence diagrams, approximately. They say when the foot is on the ground, right, and what order they come out of ground, that's what defines the gate. So you can write a little, sorry, you can write an enormous um, optimization that puts these things together, but doesn't have to define, doesn't have to derive those equations individually. I'll tell you how in a second. And you can, for instance, um, I could do, walk, I'll do the walking trot. Uh, it's a little slow in this version, but sure could be made faster. And it's also not very optimized. Yeah, I, I'm kind of allergic to tuning. You could definitely like, there you go. All right, so that was just saying I want my feet to be on the ground. I want to move forward, get to a thing, make a big optimization, and you got to walk, walking gait. Pretty good, huh? Yeah. So you could um, solve n different optimizations with n different mode schedules. The, you know, the thinking is that that doesn't scale because the mode schedules blow up combinatorially. So um, there's ways to relax these constraints. Uh, or we have some, uh, some newer work with graphs that try to combine graph search with, with uh, continuous optimization to make that so you can, so you can solve those problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is finding a nominal trajectory. It's not stabilizing. It's no stabilization. You could do it. You could do it as an MPC loop. Um, you could. Uh, well, there's an LQR equivalent. We'll talk about hybrid LQR next time, I think. So all those things are possible. That one actually, I think, is open loop stable. I, okay, I have a funny story, right? I always have. You guys get remind me of these things. So Little Dog was this DARPA. It's like a mini DARPA challenge. It was a DARPA program, right? And they, so they had they asked so. Boston Dynamics had just made Big Dog, which was awesome. And they're like, we want universities to help uh, you know, think about the next things. And they made us a little dog. It's less awesome. But, uh, but still cute. It's like, it looks like an iron, roughly. And, um, and we got to the, the initial presentation uh, where all the, all the faculty that had gotten the grant went to this meeting. And uh, Boston Dynamics brought the dog. And basically, they're like, um, here, DARPA brought this challenge board. Right, it was like a, this rough terrain that they had 3D printed. And we all came here to meet each other for the first time. And um, Boston Dynamics, just to show the dog, made this like open loop trajectory look about like that. And they set it down, and it just walked. Uh, with no feedback. It was just like, you know, a PD control or whatever. It just walked right over the DARPA challenge board. They're like, ah, I guess we need a harder challenge board. So, so the whole thing, like, and then the next one they gave was like Mount Everest. Uh, 
which the robot I don't think is physically capable of doing. But so it took like three iterations till we got to the sweet spot. But uh, but actually, if you just play the open loop trajectory, you know, with PD control, so it's got joint local joint control. But, um, little dog actually walks pretty well just like that. You don't need much. Yeah. Yep. So you could make uh, you could make your final mode be standing still, and it would just be one more transition. This one I chose to be periodic, but you can solve another trajectory optimization to transition from your periodic gate to the standing gate, or to start from standing up to, to walking. That would be the sort of way to link them together. You might have a periodic gate you run for a long time, you know, as many times as you want, and then these transition gates. Did you have a question before? Okay, yeah. All right, let me answer Jagdeep's question here about uh, how do I not write all of those equations all the time for little dog? Well, I should leave that equation up. I'm going to use that again. Okay, so um, let's think about it for the rimless wheel. I kind of, I want to remove the assumption that one foot is on the ground and I've derived effectively the minimal coordinates. Well, so, so let me say it that way. So the way we've done it before was in a minimal, minimal coordinates. Right, so I, I assumed the foot was already on the ground. And my Q was just theta. Right, so I effectively contact made a pin joint here, which you could think of as a constraint. But I solved away that constraint and came up with a coordinate system in theta that was unconstrained. Right? If I have written instead the dynamics of the rimless wheel, okay, just in the air, then maybe I have x, y, and theta as my variables. I could figure out, I could write a constrained dynamics here, which says that the foot is on the ground. Possibly that the foot's location also is uh, this would be like foot on ramp. Foot doesn't move. Okay, you could write constraints on the dynamics like this. I could operate in this higher dimensional. Um, Space, but just add extra constraints on my trajectories. Optimization makes that relatively easy to do. There's one important detail, though, is how do you actually get the equations of motion that are correct on the constraint manifold? To do that, again, you don't have to do it yourself because the dynamics engine can do these for you, okay? But um, this is the full sort of dynamics of a system that has contact. So what you can do is basically say, I've got a force at every possible contact point. OK, I'll call that force lambda, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, lambda 4. It's got a fictitious force there, OK? The way a fictitious force enters the equations of motion is it gets multiplied by the Jacobian, which turns out called the contact Jacobian. It's a kinematic quantity that relates that force to the state variables. And it's just added. They, they, amazingly, it enters um, additively like this, linearly. Okay. And so in order to simulate the dynamics forward in this constraint manifold, you actually have to take these constraints and these tell you what the forces must be in order to satisfy that constraint. Again, the full derivation's in the notes, but I just want to give you the intuition here. So if you want this to be true, that also suggests that 
this is true, which also suggests that this is true, and this term, for this term to be true, which depends on q double dot, this allows you to solve for lambda to make those true. So there's a, a way to, to solve for the contact forces that make your dynamics constraints stay satisfied. That's actually how solve, a lot of solvers will do it. If you want to, if you had a four bar linkage and you wanted to simulate a closed loop chain, then you actually have to solve kind of a kinematic, uh, you know, you have to solve for the forces that hold it together. Okay, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe Trajopt could do that in general. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yes, yes. I've seen like uh, the the movie The Mummy had like super awesome special effects where there was this like smoke and then the, the mummy's face came out of the smoke and stuff like that. I heard I heard a talk by the people who simulated that in the physics team. Um, the first thing they did, they're like, "This is the Navier-Stokes equations." That's hard, so we canceled out these, and then, <laughs> then they're like, okay, that was pretty good enough you know, for visual effects, and then they did what you say. Like, they kind of put forces that kind of, uh, artificial forces in the air that, that kind of guided it. Yeah, exactly right. So the, in an optimization problem, in the little dog notebook, if you, if you scroll down through that, you'll see that it defined for each segment not only x, you know, q and q dot over time, but also lambda over time. In the segments where lambda was above the ground, it, was set, it just said lambda has to be zero. That's a new constraint. Uh, and when the foot was on the ground, it said lambda had to be, you know, the, the lambda had to be sufficient so that the foot stayed on the ground. And then it, that's enough. So we call this um, the floating, this is the minimal coordinates. I tend to call this the floating base coordinates. And just to distinguish that from there's also, some people will do maximal coordinates. I mean, for the rimless wheel, I guess it, they're the same, but maximal coordinates. So if I had like a compass gate, for instance, if I have two links, the maximal coordinates would be, um, let's say Q is going to be X1, Y1, theta1, X2, Y2, theta2. Like for every single link, you write the whole, you know, it could be anywhere in space. And then you have every joint is a constraint saying that these things are held together. And then uh, versus the floating base for a compass gate would be just, uh, we'll do x, y for the floating base, but then we'll just do theta 1, theta 2, and stay inside the robot will stay minimal, which is the most practical one. I think you were first. Oh, no, you were first. Sorry. Okay. That's true. Yep. Uh, that's right. The, the, well, the planner is not simulating the contact. It's only getting the contact through these equations. And to be clear, so there's a, there's a way to solve for lambda explicitly, which is in the appendix. But in, in the little dog notebook, it actually, I just made lambda a decision variable. That by, and, I, and I put it in like this, so I knew how to enter it into the, into the forces. And then I just asked for these to be true. And it solved for lambda. So it, it didn't have to do just the way you didn't have to solve an impact map or whatever. It solved for lambda implicitly to make those things true and this true simultaneously. It doesn't have a, it, there's nothing in the optimization saying if this, then there's force. It says the forces enter like this, which is, this is a much better thing to tell an optimizer, these smooth functions. You don't want to tell the optimizer the if function if you don't, if you don't have to, right? Yeah, Jackie. Um, why is it not a regular right now? 
That's, uh, that's given by the mode sequence. If you, if you come with the mode sequence, then you know everything you need to write this. So it's just chicken, egg. That was, uh, you, if you did take that trajectory and played it open loop, you could get a physics simulation out of it. That was just the plan playback. This is just animating the trajectory that came out of the solver. It would, I think it would look identical if I just took that trajectory now and played it open loop. Then the contact solver would determine when it's in the ground, but I think the motion of the, of the legs would be still consistent with that, so it would play out. Yes, sorry, you do, yes. Um, so if you, if you are doing it, um, so if you're solving for it, if you, if you assume that it's exactly sticking contact and solve it for explicitly, then that can be done without this. But in the, in the more general case, you would say that like lambda is inside a friction cone, for instance. You certainly want to say lambda is greater than or equal to zero, right? The, the, yeah. Yes, that's true. Otherwise, you would get funny magic board. Or you would, it would pull you into the ground and things like that. Mm -hmm. It's actually a pretty natural stopping point since we're at 52. Any other questions about that? It's pretty good, right? It's like just a little bit more than the acrobat swing up, but like that's pretty cool. Yeah. All right, yeah. Cool. Just like it. As a, as a very, uh, like, you know, I'm a friend of the folks at Boston Dynamics. I don't know, I've never seen their code or whatever. But the way they talk about it in their public talks, I would say that the way that Atlas is running through the course, it is using perception and a, and a, a plan to roughly say, I'm going to step here and there and there through the parkour course. And then it's solving something like these hybrid trajectory optimizations on the fly, very fast. Their code is better than my code. And uh, it, it, like, runs at 100 hertz. Right, and it's it's or more. I don't know what, the, what that number is, and, uh, and and they're they're roughly using this in the pipeline. There's there's a, there's some simplifications that we'll talk about when we get to humanoids, but it's um, it's not far from what you would want. So they don't have to resolve the just walking up. It's solved offline. That's sort of like we have a policy. Uh, I think, given the course and the perception, they are they have handfuls of like uh, you know simple heuristics to say I'm, I know I'm going to step here I know I'm going to step here I know I'm going to step here, which basically defines the mode sequence on the fly. That would be my guess. So so it's kind of like a, on the fly. There's a system that's saying what's my mode sequence, and uh, and then they can plan through that. They can probably soften that a bit. Yeah, but it would I don't think they're going to. The optimizer is going to be choosing a different foot place to step, for instance. Yep. Uh, it's a good question. So how, how does perception come into this? This is very much in the sort of I know the environment kind of, of world. Uh, I think the way it's starting to play out in the land of foundation models, which I uh, am part of and think highly of, uh, is that you might do this uh, as a way to generate data, for instance, but then try to transition this into an output feedback policy that you'd run on the real robot if you wanted to do something like that. So if there's, I think in situations, I mean, Atlas has gotten pretty far with perception of the world and, and uh, being able to do that. And I think for more com like really complicated manipulation things, it's typically being mapped into a neural network so that you can play back from cameras. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Okay, see you next time.